And now we get to the real heart of the experiment, the section on dialysis. With dialysis, we still use a semi-permeable membrane, but this semi-permeable membrane is going to limit the types of solutes which can cross from one side to the other based on their size. So it's going to limit uh, the particles which can cross uh, to only the smallest particles. As particles get larger and larger, ultimately what happens is that uh, they become much more difficult for them to cross till eventually they're blocked entirely. So the solvent and very small particles are able to cross rapidly. It's almost as if there isn't even a barrier there for some of these. With what we'll call our medium-sized particles, they're going to cross slowly because most of the time they are going to actually impact the barrier rather than make it through the various pores. But if they hit the barrier just right, they will manage to go through the pores and escape. Particles which are too large cannot fit through the pores at all and are therefore unable to go through the membrane no matter how much time is given. So let's go ahead and simulate this whole process here. Uh, I want to imagine here that the dialysis tubing is going to be uh, represented here by these lines and the spaces in between the lines are going to represent the pores that come between them. Now the solvent I'm representing here by all of these little tiny dots and so you can think of those for example as being water molecules and so you see they're so small compared to the pores that they cross really easily. Now none of the drawings by the way are going to be uh, to any kind of uh, actual shape here. We're just trying to get a conceptual idea for what these look like. So for example, imagine that we have here this tiny solute particle. Um, this might, for example, be our chloride ion, although the size of it is actually uh, much too large compared to what I've got here as the solvent. So not everything is to scale, but imagine again, this is a very small solute particle. It easily passes through the pore. Now, let's say we have a medium-sized solute particle, and I'm going to, for example, here use uh, this hexagon to represent uh, the carbohydrate glucose. As you're going to see when we get to the carbohydrates chapter, there's a reason why I would use a hexagon for that. So you'll notice it's just about as large as those pores, and if it goes ahead and approaches the dialysis tubing, it's likely to just bounce off of it unless it manages to just go through the pore at just the right orientation. So you can imagine it's going to take a lot of bouncing back and forth and back and forth for that solute particle before it actually makes it right through those pores. So some of it should make it through. Now imagine we have a very large particle here. This is going to be something that the lab manual will call a colloid or a colloidal particle you'll notice that there's pretty much no way that a particle of this size could possibly be expected to go through one of those pores. So when it hits the walls, it just kind of bounces off and isn't able to escape. So we would expect a very large particle to stay trapped on one side of the dialysis tubing. Another technique that we are going to look at is the technique of filtration. And this is something which should already be familiar to you. So we can filter insoluble solids uh, to separate them out from their solutions by using the process here of filtration. And if you've ever made coffee, you've done this. If you've ever made tea, uh, where you have a tea bag acting as a filter, for example, uh, you've encountered filtration. As I said, it should be totally familiar to you. So what we'll have here is, let's say we have a mixture that contains a solvent, and in that solvent are soluble solutes and insoluble particles that are not dissolved within. If we try to go ahead and put a mixture through a piece of filter paper, gravity will pull the solution down through the filter paper. And the very large insoluble solutes will remain on the paper uh, and will not be able to pass through. However, any solute so long as it is soluble, we would expect to pass through the filter paper uh, with the solvent, including those large colloidal particles 
that uh, I had discussed uh, just a moment ago and represented with the yellow cloud that could not escape through the, uh, through the dialysis tubing. Okay, so even very large solutes, so long as they can dissolve, should go through. And so what would we expect when we compare pore size? So dialysis tubing, as we said, has pores in it. And the paper that makes up the filter paper, if we looked at it uh, in a special type of microscope, you'd see that it also has pores uh, that are irregularly shaped. They're kind of made up of these uh, branched fibers that stretch all the way through the paper. And if we go ahead and were to look at them, we would notice that the pores, if we can really use that term in the filter paper, are huge by comparison to the pores in the dialysis tubing. So they're not big enough to even let, let a grain of sand through. So even grains of sand can't pass through those pores, but they are certainly large enough to allow most solute particles uh, that are dissolved to pass through. All right, before you begin this experiment, it's very important that you read through all of the material at the beginning because it contains some information that you need in order to answer some of those pre-lab and post-lab questions. And without that information, you're going to look at those questions and say, oh, he didn't cover that in the video. No, I, you're right, I didn't. Uh, so it's going to be important, as I said, for you to get those information, that bit of information out of the beginning. And specifically, that information has to do with the concentration of various species uh, in cellular solutions. So for example, the concentration of sodium chloride, the concentration of glucose, that kind of thing. You want to zero in on that. In part A, we're going to look at ways of identifying various chemical species that we will use throughout the remainder of the experiment. Now when we get to part B, we're going to have a solution which will contain three different solutes, chloride ions, glucose, and starch. Now the problem with all of these solutes is when they're dissolved in water, they don't really give any good visual evidence uh, that they're present. They don't change the color of the solution. Uh, they're not solid. Starch does tend to make the solution cloudy, but only when it's quite concentrated. So that's not really a very exact way of identifying whether or not it's present. So we want to come up with tests that tell us whether or not uh, the chemical that we're looking for is in fact in a particular solution. So we're going to go ahead and look at chemical tests for each one of these solutes. Now some terminology here that's very important and that is this. We say that when we conduct a test that the test result is positive if we find the thing we are looking for and negative if it is not. This has nothing to do with charge, so positive charge or negative charge, and it certainly has nothing to do with the connotation of the word positive meaning something good and negative meaning something is bad. For example, if a patient tests positive for, say, tuberculosis, that's certainly not a good thing. It's telling you that they do have tuberculosis, whether you're looking for tuberculosis antibodies or you're doing some kind of x-ray, positive means that they have the disease. So it's just confirming by saying yes or no. So positive is a yes, negative is a no. Now the first test that we're gonna conduct is the test for the presence of chloride ions. You recall that chloride ions is just a chlorine atom with a negative one charge. And chloride reacts uh, very rapidly and very obviously with silver ions, which has silver with a positive one charge. And when they react together, they form a precipitate, the white solid silver chloride. So now the silver ions can't just be floating on their own. You'll recall that any solution with ions, there has to be just as many positive ions or positive charges as there are negative charges. So the solution we're actually going to use here is silver nitrate. The nitrate ions remain dissolved and do not participate in any reactions whatsoever, so we're essentially going to pretend that they're not there. So, when silver and chloride react together, and they're both floating around in an aqueous solution, they come together to form silver chloride, a solid. 
This is what we call a net ionic equation. It's only showing the ions which are participating in the particular reaction. The next two tests are for identifying starch and glucose. So we look for starch by adding a brown solution of iodine. I hope that's brown. My color blindness sometimes leads me astray when it comes down to some colors. So if in fact it's more of a red or something else, please forgive me on that. And then we test for glucose using uh, what is called Benedict's reagent. And the most important part of Benedict's reagent is going to be uh, copper ions, specifically the copper two ion. Now the reactions that go on here are quite a bit more complicated and so we're not going to write chemical equations for those. So the whole point of part A is to show you what a positive test looks like for all of these. Each of the tests only focuses on one solute at a time. So for example the silver which we talked about only tells us whether or not there's chloride present. It has no effect on the starch, it has no effect on the glucose. So if you're looking for three different species you have to do three different tests, one for each one of them. It's very important that you make very careful notes of what you observe in part A because you're going to rely on that information for determining whether or not the species is present when you get to parts B and C. So let's, let's go to the lab and see these tests in action. 